We're going to talk a little bit about Christmas, and there's a lot of complaining about Christmas. You guys are just out to sabotage me today. Now Brian's over here throwing me out. <laughs> so, so what's wrong with Christmas? I mean, what, what's really wrong with it? Uh, some would say uh, it's commercialism. And it's been too commercialized. We hear that all the time. I can remember my mother, she would complaining that uh, it was barely a week after Thanksgiving and they already had Christmas decorations out in the store. Some of you can remember that. And then a few years rocked on and it was Thanksgiving and they already have, and now it's Halloween and they already have Christmas decorations out. Commercialism. Well, I'd like to quote from one of my uh, favorite theologians. His name's Alfred. And here's what Alfred had to say about it. He said, you know, there's a lot of bad isms floating around out there. But one of the worst is commercialism. Make a buck. Make a buck. Even in Brooklyn, it's the same. Nobody cares what Christmas stands for. Just make a buck. Make a buck. Now, yes, yeah, some of you recognize Alfred. He made that statement in 1947. So things haven't really changed all that much. The timing may have changed. But the heart of the issue, the true problem, has been around for a long time. So what is it? What is the true problem? What's wrong with Christmas? Is it happy holidays? Well, Bing Crosby's been crooning out happy holidays for as long as I can remember. I don't know that that's it. Is it Christmas trees? I don't think that's it. What about Santa Claus? Has Santa Claus replaced Jesus? I don't think so. I mean, I like Santa Claus. He brings me all kinds of good stuff. <laughs> You know? Jesus brings me eternal life. I like him better. But I also like the stuff Santa Claus brings me. So I don't think it's Santa Claus. I don't think the problem at all is what non-Christians or even Christians have added to Christmas. I think the problem with Christmas is what we Christians have lost in our worship and celebration of Christmas. We've lost our focus. In, in all of the celebratory things we do, which again are, are all good in context, we've lost the focus of what the true meaning of Christmas is all about. What is this missing element in our celebrations of Christmas? I'd like to read a quote from you from another one of my favorite theologians. Maybe a little more of a serious theologian than our friend Alfred. Uh, this is John MacArthur. Uh, many of you know him. And this is from a little book he wrote uh, years ago. And uh, here's what he says. At the heart of Christmas is a celebration of the incarnation of God. Emmanuel. God with us. When you see what Christmas really means, your immediate response will be worship. Your immediate response will be worship. Worship is the missing element in our Christmas celebrations. Note, worship is more than religious activity. It is at first a state of the heart. That's what's missing from Christmas. Now hopefully that's not missing in our celebration of Christmas. But that's what's missing in the bigger picture. The world has lost its awe and in that we Christians have lost in a large sense our sense of worship and awe at the incarnation that very God of very God would come to this earth in the most vulnerable manner 
Uh, there's nothing more helpless and vulnerable than a human infant. And allow himself to go through what he went through in order that we might have eternal life. I was uh, impressed last Wednesday night. We had a little service here and uh, Tracy and Jim uh, planned it and led it and did a, a, a marvelous job. And I was sitting there where I, I always sit and uh, we were singing Christmas carols. Tracy was giving us some background and uh, we were singing them. And as we sang some of the time I looked at the cross and I would think about we're singing these Christmas carols because of what Jesus did on the cross. And then some of the time I would look over here at the Christmas tree and I would think isn't it wonderful that Christ came and gave us all this beauty that we enjoy. So you see I was worshiping when I looked at the cross but I was also worshiping when I looked at the Christmas tree because I was contemplating the reason we have that Christmas tree. The Creator who made that Christmas tree, if you will. We can look at all of these things and have an attitude of worship about ourselves. But that sort of begs the question then, what is worship? What is true biblical worship? Is it, is it coming to a service? And by the way, we'll have a Christmas Eve service, 615. And I hope you're all here. What better way to start the celebration of Christ's birth than right here with Christ's people? Biblical worship is an interesting thing because as, as MacArthur pointed out, it's not a religious activity. I could have sat through that whole Wednesday night service and never for a single moment worshipped. If all I was doing was singing hymns because the hymns are pretty, if all I was doing was filling my seat because I'm the pastor and I'm expected to be here, I would have been doing a religious activity, but it would not have been worship. You see, it was worship because of what my mind and my heart were focused on. And by the way, your heart can't focus on anything that doesn't go through your mind first. You see, because your mind feeds your heart. Let me just briefly uh, give you an idea of what biblical worship is. Because biblical worship, there's one element that is always there uh, that I don't think we understand. And I don't think we really like it too much. And that element that is always present in true biblical worship is in a word sacrifice. Now, we Westerners, when we hear that word, we don't think of it in a biblical context. We think of sacrifice, oh, no, I've got to give up something here, or I've got to do something I don't want to do. Oh. But now, if you were to talk to a Hebrew or, or a first century Christian about sacrifice, they're excited. You read in the Old Testament the, about the, the sacrifices, what were they always accompanied by? Feasting and joy and gladness and, uh, you know, those Hebrews were party people. And some of the, those things went on for days. Sacrifice was a time of great joy. It was a time when mere creatures could actually give something to the eternal God. And so, sacrifice is not a bad word. Sacrifice is a good word. And we, we should enter into it with expectation and joy. You, know, you read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and blameless and acceptable to Him. So sacrifice can include presenting ourselves. I, I think it was Rick Warren that said one time something to the effect of when people tell him, well, you know, Pastor, I didn't come to that event because, but I was there in spirit. He said, no, you weren't. 
<laughs> your spirits wherever you are. <laughs> but we like to say things like that, don't we? It makes us feel better about ourselves. But he's right. Where you go, your spirit goes. You know, your spirit isn't some animate thing that you can, like your wallet, you can pull out of your pocket and set it over here and then go to the store and realize you left it at home. <laughs> your spirit's wherever you are. So sacrifice involves showing up, being present. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, Paul uh, is congratulating some folks on the fact that they had given generously for his support and he was doing well, he wasn't lacking in anything. And the way he phrases it is, I thank you for your generosity and your sacrificial giving. So sacrifice involves giving. And you think about it, if it involves our presence, our presence is a gift in a way to whatever it is we're showing up for. Uh, one more. Biblical worship involves service. In Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verse 16, the author says this, Do not neglect to do good, to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So when you give a gift to someone, when you help someone out, you are giving them a sacrifice according to biblical terms. So, you see, biblical worship involves sacrifice. Sacrifice involves showing up, giving generously, and helping where you can. Sounds almost like Christianity to me. Or at least like what Christianity should be. Okay, we established that. We, we pretty much know what worship is now. So now we're going to travel back into time to that first Christmas and we're going to see what we can learn about worshiping and Christmas from those first participants that we are so familiar with and we love so much. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I never get tired of the Christmas story. It's just awesome. You know, yesterday I we spoke at the men's breakfast and we talked about the three wise men. And I'll talk about the three wise men again today here in a few minutes. And I'd talk about, about them tomorrow if I could get anybody to listen to me. Uh, it's just a great, great, great story, for, especially for we Christians. So let's look and see what we can learn. And, and the first group we want to look at is the shepherds. And I want to read that for you. I know you've read it a hundred times and you know it, but it's just something that's dear to my heart. And I hope yours too. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God on the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Wow. Quite a story, isn't it? But why shepherds? Why would angels come and talk to shepherds? First century shepherds are kind of low on the totem pole of society. Uh, didn't smell very good. Didn't look very good. Didn't know much. They were, for the most part, illiterate. Just shepherds. Why would the angels come to them? I'll give you one reason. Now we can speculate, there could be a lot of reasons. But I'll give you one reason. I think they came to the shepherds because the shepherds were willing to listen. The shepherds were listeners, if you will. Said the night to the mighty wind, Do you hear what I hear? The shepherds were listening. I think if we were 
especially at Christmas time, listening a little more attentively, we might hear God speak a little more clearly into our lives. You know, people say, well, God never says anything to me. Well, maybe you're not listening. You see? Now, I don't mean he speaks in an audible voice. Now, he can, and he may. I don't know, but he never has to me. But I know he's spoken into my life and into my heart and into my mind. But you have to be listening to hear. Now, look what the shepherds did. They dropped everything they were doing. All of a sudden, the most important thing to their existence was getting to see that baby. Now, you ask if you are keeping Christmas as Christians should, there's a touchstone for you. What is the most important thing driving you this Christmas? Is it a bargain? Is it a list of gifts? Is it a party? Or is it the birth of your Savior, Jesus Christ? Let's go straight to Bethlehem, the shepherd said. You get it? The urgency there? They're, they're not going to wander around and take the scenic route to Bethlehem. They're going to go straight to Bethlehem. They're going to get there as soon as they can, as quick as they can. You know, it says they ran to see that Savior. They took a big chance. What if they returned and there were no sheep? Well, if they were their sheep, which they could have been, they would go hungry. If they were someone else's sheep and they were hired shepherds, they would lose their job. And yet, they were so consumed with seeing Jesus Christ that nothing else mattered at that moment in time. And they ran to see him. And then they did one more thing. And this is what I would challenge each and every one of you to do that claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because he's commanded you to do it already. So you're either disobedient louts or you're obedient children of the king. You choose. Now this is difficult. You have to have a lot of education to do this. You have to have a lot of money. You have to just... It's really hard. Here's what the shepherds did. They told others. Wow. You know the beautiful thing about that? Every one of us can do that. We don't need to know anything more. We don't need to grow any more in our faith. All we need to know is Jesus Christ and we are 100% totally qualified to tell somebody about it. So easy. So simple. And yet so devastatingly difficult, isn't it? <laughs> because we're not focused. And when I say we, that's not a rhetorical we. That includes me. We, we're not focused like those shepherds were on Jesus Christ. And that's the place we want to strive to come to. But what about the, the magi, the wise men? What are they doing in this story? Well, and why did God call them a bunch of heathens from over in Persia somewhere, probably Babylon? Why does he want to include them in this story? Well, because like the shepherds, they were watching. Now the shepherds were listening. I understand I said that. And I'm going to modify it just a little bit for the wise men. The wise men were watching. And what were they watching for? They were watching for a star. Now, if as I think the biblical record supports the story, Daniel originally, when he was made head of the wise men in Babylon, shared with them the idea of a coming Messiah. And it had been handed down through the years. It had been a lot of years. Why were they still watching? It would have been so easy for them to say, ah, 
We've watched for years, there's no star out there. Let's go have a beer. <laughs> yeah. They didn't do that. They kept watching. And so, the star appeared, and when it appeared, they didn't miss it. You know, you've all heard that old saw, you tend to find what you're looking for. That's true. If you're looking for the good in Christmas, if you're looking for Christ in Christmas, if you're looking for Christ in the other people in this room, you'll probably see him. And if you're looking for the bad, you'll probably see that. Because there's enough bad in all of us that it can be, it, it can be seen. So be watchful like the, the wise men. And then the wise men, like the shepherds, they were willing. They were willing to make a sacrifice. The shepherds sacrificed the safety of their sheep and what they were doing and went to Bethlehem. Well, what about the wise men? Now again, it's debated, but I think the best scenario for them is that they were probably in Babylon. And depending on the route you take, it's, it's approximately 800 to 1,000 miles from Babylon to, to uh, Jerusalem. They're going to do this on camels with an entourage with them, loaded down with supplies. And they figure a camel will make about 20 miles a day under those conditions. So you can do the math. It's going to take them about 40 days, best case scenario, to get there. Now, they're going across some of the most inhospitable land on the earth. You know, as, as the Northwest is beautiful, so that part of the world is not beautiful. <laughs> you know? Now, we're talking about wise men. We're talking about the elite of society here. They would have wonderful living conditions. They would have good food. They would have good drink. And they would have lots of it. Why would they leave that to undertake this arduous journey? And not only was it arduous, it was dangerous. They were willing to make that sacrifice to see this Jesus. And what happens when they find him? Let me, let me read that for you. Uh, the, the wise men are in uh, Matthew chapter 2. I'll just read the whole story for you. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned some of the wise men, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed a different way. In verse 11, when they saw the baby, what did they do? They fell down and they worshipped him. See? They demonstrated their feelings for this baby with their actions. They fell down and they worshipped him. Again, I think what's wrong with Christians and I'm with Christmas, and I'm as guilty of this as any of you, maybe even more so, is 
we don't take the opportunities we are given to fall down and worship him now I'm, I'm talking figuratively most of the time and I, I'll give you an example and as usual I'm behind the curve on this my wife was right on top of it she knew everything that was going on and but I didn't but it, it's a wonderful thing that happened and I don't get all choked up all that easily but uh, we were out in Hazeldale running some errands the other day and uh, we go to Costco out there on 78th Street and you know, we buy our stuff do whatever we're going to do and we're heading out the door and you know how at Costco they always have this somebody standing there I don't know why they do that but they always do and they make this little mark on your receipt so we're heading out the door and there's this, this black guy standing there and he's going to swipe our receipt and I think I said how are you or something and he said I'm wonderful my father is the richest man in the universe and I'm his son and I said oh wow well so is ours and he said oh I don't remember what he said then but he just reached out and he grabbed us both and hugged us and Merry Christmas and and out the door we went and uh, anyway Sue recognized him and evidently a lot of you know who he is I didn't have a clue but he took an opportunity there to figuratively fall down and worship Jesus Christ by sharing and I'll put a plug in for Costco God bless them for letting him do that because he's very overt about it and it was really cool it made my day now how often do we have opportunities to respond like that and not you see that guy had the true spirit of Christmas going on inside of him and then a little of it leaked out on us it was marvelous I felt better all the rest of the day and then what else did the wise men do they gave him gifts didn't they and what did they give him did they say to each other before they came well you know that couch is getting a little worn we should get a new one and we'll give the old one to Jesus <laughs> because he can really use it in the youth room or whatever no they did not they took the very best stuff they had which happened to be gold frankincense and myrrh and that's what they gave to Jesus Wow what if we did it that way you ever hear of somebody buying a new car and giving it to Jesus and keeping their old one for them to drive I never have either and to my shame I've never done anything like that I'm just as bad as the rest of you but what if like the wise men we started giving the best and the first and keeping the rest for ourselves don't you think we have it backwards I do and like I say I I'm not doing this at all I'm doing this I'm right there with the rest of you guys Mary we find Mary in uh, Luke chapter 2 among other places uh, verses 4 and 5 here And Joseph also went up from Galilee from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary his betrothed who was with child Wow now think about that for a little bit here you've got this young girl she's nine months pregnant or thereabouts and she's going to get on a donkey and she's going to ride all the way to Bethlehem from Nazareth to Bethlehem that would be a fun thing wouldn't it how many of you ladies would like to do that <laughs> probably nobody well, how would you like to be Joseph and have to go along with her <laughs> huh? doesn't sound like fun to me it's about a 70 mile trip I don't know but what did Mary do talk about inconvenient talk about uncomfortable 
And yet, she willingly did that. She stepped out and sacrificed her comfort. Her safety, again, these are, these are dangerous journeys. And she's pregnant, so she's putting her child at risk also. And yet, she does that. And then you see in verse 19 that Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. In other words, she worshipped. Well, we can't forget Joseph, can we? No, certainly not. Let's go back over here to Matthew. Maybe, if I can get there. I'll read here verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus, for he will save his people. Hmm. Now what about that? Again, these make nice stories, but let's, let's put them in reality. These were real people living in real time. Now in, in Judaism, when you were going to get married, you first became betrothed. The betrothal would last normally a year. And once you were betrothed, it was the same as being married. The only thing was, uh, you didn't consummate the marriage until you were married. But you were as good as married in every other way. And according to Jewish law, if you had uh, sex with somebody during that time, you were subject to the death penalty. And it was up to the, the one you were betrothed to, the husband, to carry, have that carried out. Okay? So that's probably what would have happened, but it says here that Joseph was a just man and he didn't quite want to go that far, so his intention was he was just going to put her away quietly, in other words, just divorce her, and move on with his life. Now think about it from Joseph's perspective. You're engaged, and the woman you're engaged to comes to you and says, Sweetheart, I just have to share with you that I'm pregnant. What do you mean you're pregnant? You've been cheating on me? Oh, no. No. The Holy Spirit made me pregnant. Really? <laughs> Are you going to buy that? I don't think so. And what about Mary? She's got to tell him this. Back up to her for a minute, you know. But she's got to be scared to death. I mean, she's got to be thinking, I'm going to tell him this, but there's no way he's going to buy it. And then Joseph has a dream. And in this dream, God tells him to go ahead and go through the wedding. Joseph had to have tremendous faith to do that. Because again, we remember these people are living in real time. And what's Joseph's occupation? He's a carpenter. Probably, from what I've been able to investigate, their, their living standard and everything, uh, he was probably, if he was alive today, would be what we would call a small contractor. You know, self-employed, maybe build a house here, a house there, whatever. But now remember, they lived in a small town of Nazareth. Everybody knew everybody. The law says he should have her killed. He does have the option to just put her aside. And what does he do? He embraces her because that's what God tells him to do. You suppose he got any ridicule over that? You suppose maybe he even lost some jobs out of that? I'm sure he did. I think it might have cost him a lot. It probably cost him his pride. It cost him his money. It may have cost him his livelihood. And ultimately it may have cost him his life. We don't know. Because it doesn't say much about him after that. Joseph traveled as Mary did. Joseph worshipped 
through his quiet, steadfast obedience. All these people, shepherds, wise men, Mary, Joseph, all so very different. They all are in such very different places in their lives. Their circumstances are all different. But they had some real commonalities, didn't they? When God called them, they moved. They came. They all moved from where they were toward where the baby was. Where are you moving? You're all going somewhere. You're either moving towards the Lord or you're not. And only you know. And they all needed the same thing. They needed a Savior. And we all need the same thing. The Savior. And what are the gifts he gives us? We talked about them a little bit last week, if you remember. He gives us the gift of forgiveness. He gives us the gift of restoration. He gives us the gift of love. He gives us the gift of humility. And then we talked about, what if this Christmas we gave those gifts to someone who, like us, doesn't deserve them? What if we forgave someone that didn't deserve to be forgiven? What if we embraced someone that doesn't deserve to be embraced? What if we gave the gift of acceptance to someone who is really quite unacceptable in our eyes? Isn't that what God has given to us? I believe so. Another thing these folks have in common is they expressed their encounter with the Savior publicly. They told someone about it. In fact, the shepherds, you remember, told everyone about it. And finally, they all gave something. And they all gave the very best that they had. Someone has said, I don't know who it was to give them credit, but it's very true. They said this, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Love will propel, love will compel you to give. After all, what compelled God to come to this earth? For God what? So loved the world that he couldn't help but give. And what did he give? The most precious and best thing he had, his only son, Jesus Christ. So you can give without loving. You can give for all kinds of reasons. But you cannot love without giving. The shepherds gave the very best they had, which was simply themselves. The shepherds are like the little drummer boy. They had no gift for the king, so they showed up. And then they went and told others. The magi... We're at the other end of the spectrum. They were the, the Bill Gates crowd. And they showed up. And they gave the best they had. They gave gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Very valuable items in that part of the world. And then there was Mary. She gave the very best she had, which was simply her body. She showed up. She carried the baby Jesus for nine months. And Joseph, he gave the very best he had, which was the same thing Mary had, simply himself.
Joseph may have never realized the, the importance of what he had done. But let's learn from these people. Let's learn from this Christmas story that the bottom line is we are to be worshipers. And I'm thinking that worship that costs us nothing is probably worth just about what it costs us. You remember in the Old Testament there's a story about Abraham and a king was going to give him a plot of land. And he wouldn't take it. He insisted he pay for it. You know. So think about that. And I don't want to upset you at Christmas time, but just think about it. Worship that costs nothing is probably worth just about what it costs. It's like that old thing, you know, what is it, free advice is worth about what it costs or something like that. So from now on, let's make sure that we put the worship back in Christmas. By we, I mean we Christians, because we're the only ones that can do it. Let's put Jesus Christ, number one, in our Christmas celebrations. Not by being negative and railing against Santa Claus and commercialism and, and all that stuff, but positively by imitating Jesus Christ. By imitating these first Christmas folks and how they worshipped. They worshipped with enthusiasm. They worshipped with their treasure. They worshipped with their physical bodies. And they worshipped, some of them probably, with their very lives. As we do this, our hearts will be overwhelmed with gratitude. It has been said also that you are never more thankful than when you give. Isn't that interesting? Kind of the opposite of what we think about, isn't it? Usually we think, well, if we receive a gift, we, we want to be sure and be thankful and say thank you and all that. And that's true, that's good. But when we give our worship and our hearts to Christ, that's when we're overwhelmed with thankfulness for what He has given and done for us. And we will be able to say with Paul, thank God for His Son a gift too wonderful for words. So I would encourage you guys to just, just think about it. Be listening, be watching for opportunities to speak up about Christmas and what it really means. About Christ. And like the guy at Costco. You know, you can do it so innocuously. Hey, my father's rich and I'm going to be rich. You know? And then it opens the door and he can tell the story. I'll give you one more way to worship. You know, as we, this Christmas, think about what it is you can give to Jesus. And I don't know what that is. It can be, it can run the whole spectrum from what the shepherds had to give to what the magi had to give. And just, just think about it. Because we every Christmas we give so many gifts. And we get so many gifts. But do we ever just think about and then follow through on giving a gift to Jesus? Whatever that may be. Maybe a million dollars. It may be just the gift of yourself, of just showing up. I don't know, it's whatever you have. But I do know this. The folks in our story gave the best that they had. So let's, at the very minimal, give God the gift of worship this Christmas. And you'll be amazed how much more beauty you'll see in the Christmas tree if you can see Christ at the center of it. How much more beauty you'll see in the wreaths and in all those things if you know that the cross is behind them. Pray with me. 
Father, thank you so much for Christmas. Thank you for all of its uh, exciting, wonderful things. And yet, remind us, Lord, that Christmas has its genesis in you. That if it weren't for you, there would be no Christmas. If it weren't for you, there'd be no Santa Claus because there would have been no Saint Nicholas. If it was not for you, Lord, we wouldn't be able to appreciate the beauty that surrounds us. We wouldn't be able to appreciate those who love us. And we certainly wouldn't be able to love the unlovely, to forgive those who don't deserve it, and to accept those who aren't acceptable. And so, Lord God, give us a blessed, wonderful Christmas. Bring us all back here for the Christmas Eve service. And give us the boldness to invite a friend to come with us to that service. We ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.